like to ask your opinion on these eight things, what your thoughts are, if you would recommend this. Number one, do you recommend people get colonoscopies? Number two, do you recommend people get mammograms? Number three, do you recommend PSA tests? Number four, do you recommend flu shots, annual flu shots? Number five, do you recommend young girls and boys get the HPV sh vaccine shot? Number six, do you recommend stents? Number seven, do you recommend bypass surgery? Number eight, do you recommend angioplasties? If you could um, either give no comment if you have no thought or a thought on those eight particular things. Colonoscopy is one, mammograms two, PSA three, flu shot four, HPV shot for girls and boys five, stent six, bypass surgery seven, and angioplasty eight. Okay, I'll go first. Um, colonoscopy, I'll start with that. Uh, the Canadian government took colonoscopy off of its list of recommended screenings for most people because there's not a single randomized trial that has ever shown that colonoscopy reduces the risk of dying of colon cancer. And the reason for doing population screening is to reduce the risk of dying or comorbidity. Um, there are other tests that are equally effective and non-invasive, and um, I think that there are certainly times when colonoscopy is is warranted, but as a population screening tool, you simply can't recommend it based on the evidence, in my opinion. Uh, mammography, same thing. The, the risk of being harmed by a mammogram, if I get any mammograms, is three times higher than the chance you'll benefit. And the reason is that mammograms are really good at finding small um, uh, conf you know, masses like ductal carcinoma in situ that 88% of the time do not develop into cancer, but these patients get treated like cancer patients. So you have surgery, biopsies, surgery, radiation, sometimes chemotherapy, increasingly uh, mastectomy, bilateral mastectomy. Well, the problem with this is that if you don't really have cancer and you get treated like a cancer patient, there's only harm, there cannot be any benefit. What's even more egregious is that all of the women that I'm describing with this particular condition, DCIS, would be alive five years later without intervention, so you throw people into the survival pool, which makes it looks like, look like breast cancer treatment is better than it actually is or that it's improving. Um, I happen to be a personal friend of the researcher who discovered prostate-specific antigen. His name is Dr. Richard Ablin, and he wrote a book called The Great Prostate Hoax. He's been trying to tell people for decades now that PSA is not a marker for cancer. It's not a marker for cancer. Um, the only applicability it has is as a marker for somebody who actually has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, as, as in it has left the prostate capsule, invaded the lymph nodes. Um, it has some usefulness in those cases, but the false positive rate is 78% um, for that test. So as a screening tool, it's extremely dangerous. The original approval, if you go back to the original approval at the FDA, it was only approved for the monitoring of patients who had been diagnosed with real prostate cancer. Um, and what happened was that every company that made the test violated the approval rules and marketed it for general screening and then public pressure caused the FDA to approve it later for the general population. So I don't recommend PSA testing. Um, I've written about four articles on the flu shot. I just wrote one. The efficacy rate this year is 10%, um, according to the Australian government. Um, there has never been a year where it's actually been effective. And if you take a look at the incidence of flu, uh, right now you're getting a lot of the, have you guys seen the stuff about the epidemic of flu? Yeah. The last time this happened was in 2009 with the H1N1. And CBS did a story on this. In fact, our, one of our speakers this fall is an investigative reporter who has been involved in some of these kinds of things. Um, so here's what happened. Um, the government, the CDC, World Health Organization, everybody said we're going to have this epidemic of flu. And the numbers <coughs> weren't hitting the board. They just weren't hitting the board. So the CDC and the World Health Organization instructed physicians to stop testing for flu and to consider anybody who came into the ER or doctor's office who had symptoms, just catalog those as, as flu uh, cases. Well, a reporter got interested in this and started doing some research and got the records from the various state uh, uh, health departments that were collecting the data, and there was no epidemic of the flu. What happened is everybody who had a cough or a fever and the government started scaring everybody, went running to the ER and the whole nine yards. You had an epidemic of people with, high f with fevers and coughs sitting in the ER who were adding to the epidemic. So it would take longer to tell you the story, but it was entirely invented and it's being entirely invented now. 
I mean, the actual risk of developing flu in, in the worst of years is about less, is a little over 3%, and the flu vaccine maybe reduces it by 1.2% when you get to absolute rather than relative numbers. So all harm, no benefit. The HPV vaccine, I don't think there's ever, we, we called that the help pay for Vioxx. That's what we think HPV stands for. It was Merck's way to bail themselves out of the last billion dollar mess they got themselves into. But um, I mentioned this this afternoon, Cochrane Collaboration has sued the European Medicines Agency, uh, alleging scientific fraud and misconduct in um, the flu and the uh, HPV vaccine. And what happened, I'll tell you, this is the misbehavior that goes on, and you should know this. So a woman in Belgium had a lot of patients coming in who had been injured by HPV, had the shot, and the young girl develops Guillain-Barre, ends up paralyzed, all kinds of things happening. So she wrote up some case reports, and then she asked the European Medicines Agency to look into it. So here's how they looked into it. They wrote to the two drug companies who sell the vaccine in Europe, and said, uh, we have some allegations that your vaccine could be harmful, so we want you to check your records and see if you see anything that we should be paying attention to. And this is so shocking, they couldn't find any evidence that their vaccines were harmful. So, the, yeah, <laughs> who would know, right? So uh, they wrote up a report saying, we've investigated thoroughly and we can't find any evidence that the vaccine is causing a problem, and the uh, Cochrane folks felt so strongly about that they sued. Uh, HPV is off the schedule in Japan. They've opened centers to take care of the injured women uh, because there are so many. And over 10,000 doctors in Spain have signed a petition saying that this should be taken off the schedule in Spain. Um, I'm going to let my colleague who knows more about cardiology talk about stents bypass and angioplasty. I will just say this. I think stents bypass and angioplasty are beneficial for certain populations of people, and I would echo your all of our comments, I think, through the evening have been that there should be clinical judgment involved, and, and we seem to have just lost that. So we're, we're, we're doing many, way too many of these procedures, but for the people they're good for, they do save lives, and if we can just do them to those people, we would be, we would be fine. That's what I have to say. That was amazing, just to listen to that. That's great, great job. So I'll just talk about the revascularization stuff. And uh, yes, this has been uh, quite a road during, during my career, watching them develop. I was actually at Emory when Andreas Grunzik came and brought the technique from Switzerland, and you saw him putting on these courses that gradually diffused out all, all over everywhere to do angioplasties. And then, you know, the Achilles, Achilles heel was that about uh, six months later, 50% of those balloon dilations had failed. And so then they started putting stents in, and the stents looked really good until six months later when they had failed. Um, but then they drug, uh, developed drug-eluting stents, and those actually do better. The problem is it leaves a raw surface, so you have to take medication to make sure it doesn't clot. Um, the interesting transition that's happened over the last few years, including just this, this last big heart association meeting, was the recognition that, we, that they were overutilized, and that um, we really needed to try to focus on the benefit. So how many of you have heard of three-vessel, I had a three-vessel bypass surgery, right? Most people have heard that term, right? Well, what people don't quite understand is that two of those three vessels come off of the same one, typically. It's called the left main artery, and that is really critical. When that one gets uh, more than 50% blocked, the death rate untreated, it gets really high. Now, if you were treating them with Esselstyn diet, perhaps it wouldn't be so high, but we need another major trial uh, isolating the left main, and everyone's afraid of it because the, it's got such a, a, a nasty track record. Then the, the one of those two that it gives off is called the left anterior descending. That one has a nickname. It's called the Widowmaker, but it's really only the, the upper portion of it before it starts to give off all the branches, so that if you narrowed that or if you clotted that off, you would take out all these uh, probably a, around 50% of your heart, and so it's hard to survive that. Now, if you were to exclude, and I'm, I'm sorry for anyone who's had a stent in here in the rest of the circulation, but if you were to exclude the left main and the proximal left anterior descending, there's never been anything to show that you improve the outcome of a patient. And I know that's a strong statement, but there's general recognition now that even though people are still doing it, and I know there's some hotbeds of this here in New York, that putting stents in the right coronary artery, if someone's having a heart attack, that's different.
okay? But for the stable coronary artery disease, there's no evidence that these other places are actually improving outcomes. So what the excuse was that we can relieve angina, that is the angina pectoris, that chest pain that someone gets, they should be able to walk further on the treadmill, they should be able to climb stairs and not have to worry about, A, the chest discomfort, because it hurts, but also that they're gonna have a rhythm disturbance and have sudden cardiac death, like an Agatha Christie novel, when somebody steals your nitroglycerin, none of which is true, by the way. Um, and so you, we were sort of into that until very recently, when a trial that you might wanna look up if you're interested in this is called the Orbita trial, Gutsy uh, folks actually did a sham uh, procedure where they pretended to put stents in half the people and put stents in the other half. And people signed up for it, so it was perfectly le legitimate, and you didn't know which group you were randomized to. Um, and they did everything as if they were putting in a stent and the other people, uh, and the people versus the people who did get the stents. And the outcomes were actually the same. And so that really has thrown the interventional community for a loop. I love to hear them, you know, backpedaling and tap dancing about, you know, how the poor, the poorly designed, and they may have some legitimate points, but at least it will give us pause about doing them um, sort of and on a widespread nature when it's not left main, proximal left anterior descending. And, then, and the, the other part of that, uh, being a card carrying nuclear cardiologist still, is that one can do tests to try to figure out how much muscle is involved. And if it's a small amount, you know, back 10 years ago, we were taking these tiny little abnormalities on nuclear stress testing and say, you have to have a stent. And it was never really true. And a guy who's at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Roy Hakamovich, showed us those crossing lines. If you don't have 13% of your muscle, that is a little more than an eighth of your heart that's in trouble, doing those stents did not do you any good. And so you have to have a lot of muscle that's in trouble. Now, Rory Hakamovich, I've always ch challenged him, he's a great guy, I would challenge him to see what could we do with diet? Where does that line move if you start doing diet? And I bet it's gonna move uh, uh, to the right substantially. So. I'm just next in line. Fortunately, I'm not a clinician. So I don't know too much about uh, that sort of thing. I think I'll pass to my friend. Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna challenge anything that Pam has said, except that I've, <clears throat> there are two friends of mine who in their late 70s had had a PSA that was a little borderline and they, you know, six months later they got another one and it, pfft, it had really gone up and that ended up getting them biopsies and then they ended up uh, having a, uh, one of them getting uh, pretty sophisticated radiation treatment and the other uh, did the operation. And uh, I, they had a pretty high uh, level of invasiveness in the terms of the, uh, oh, what's the score? What? The Gleason, the Gleason score. <laughs> and I think that they've, uh, their PSA now is, is zero. Uh, so, but you know, all the rest of it, uh, Pam, I think, has done an excellent job of reviewing that. It's interesting, historically, I feel if, very fortunate in that in 1958 at the Cleveland Clinic, there was a fellow by the name of Mason Soans, who was head of the Cleveland Clinic Catheterization Laboratory. And he was uh, looking at the image amplifier while his associate was putting the catheter in, and they, at that point, it was considered fatal to catheterize the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are supposed to carry blood, not contrast data, uh, material. And so they shot the plunger and Mason was <laughs> horrified because they were doing, at that point, catheterizations to look at the ventricle and look at the valves because you could operate on the ventricle and the, excuse me, the valves and help these people. But it wasn't in the ventricle. The whole ventricle shot went into the uh, coronary artery and Mason was looking at the image amplifier, I mean, looking at the EKG, pew, flatlined, he yelled at the patient to cough, the patient coughed, came back, and coronary artery uh, angiograms were born. But then that was 1958. 1963, when I was rotating through uh, ca uh, cardiothoracic surgery as part of my training in general surgery, 
there was a tall fellow there from Argentina who was starting the residency with me. I was just going to be there for three months as part of my rotation, but he was interested. He'd been a general surgeon in Argentina for uh, a decade, and he wanted to learn about cardiothoracic surgery. And he was, he was wonderful. He was such a friend, great pair of hands, very creative mind. Uh, his interpersonal skills were excellent. And uh, when he went back to Argentina after getting his training at the clinic, they, uh, it was not a great reception. Big deal, you got trained in Cleveland. What are we supposed to do, roll over? So he came back to Cleveland and he was such a wonderful resident, they put him on the staff full time. I'm giving you a little historical <laughs> aspect. So um, the wonderful thing was that, that this guy got along extremely well with Mason Sones. So here they had all this backlog of thousands and thousands of patients. People were coming from all over the world to see how horrible their coronary arteries were. There was nothing that could be done. There was no surgery for it. There was no angioplasty for it. There was no stenting for it. There, was, there were no bypasses. And when I was in Vietnam in uh, May of 1967, this Spaniard, uh, was, his name was Rene Favaloro, and he had a patient, he was operating on the heart, suddenly it was getting blue, he yelled at his team to prep the leg, they took out a vein, went above and below the blockage because he'd seen the x-rays, and sure enough, coronary artery surgery was born. And Sones fed Favaloro just case after case after case, and Favaloro was so creative uh, wrote up the monogram, wrote up paper after paper after paper. He was recognized throughout the world as the father of bypass surgery, and he had such a command of language. He could speak Spanish, English, Italian, and French. So practically anywhere he went in the world, he could make the company feel honored and at home getting some common language that they, uh, that they could uh, work with. And uh, there was no question that, that bypass was suddenly picked up by everybody and this was going to be the salvation. A mechanical approach to a, to a uh, biological disease. But as we've learned more and more about that, it's, we now real, really realize that there's an, that's an enormously expensive operation with tremendous morbidity and, and really significant mortality. 3% of people who get that operation across the board are gonna die. So if you do a thousand of those 30 people, people will be killed. And there is mortality even with, with stents. So these are not innocuous procedures. And right now, cardiovascular medicine is responsible for 45% of Medicare, 45%. And what is that 45%? It's drugs and it's stents and it's bypasses which have nothing whatsoever to do with the causation of the illness. And uh, so, I guess I'm not a great fan, although I admire the hell out of uh, both Mason Sones, who was my patient, and also uh, Fabularo, who was uh, a marvelous uh, human being. I just know that if they were on this panel today, they would absolutely be right at the forefront of wanting whole food, plant-based nutrition. They were that kind of person.